Well, first of all, uh, I just wanted to say I'm really, really grateful. I, I feel like I've come to full circle because I remember the days when I used to be a uh, back in the 80s. So, you know, some of the folks that I know nowadays were like, why is your mom now? And I'm like, because it's really white, and white doesn't really go, so I had to do something. But, but it's been a long time. I see a lot of faces of people that I've known uh, for a long time and respected. Um, I'm sorry, at my age now, I can really forget some good things. That's so why I'm like, great, she's back going. I think I know her name, but uh, she's not going to be great with politics. But it's, it's great to be here, uh, and I'm really honored to speak. So today, uh, I was asked to, to do something which is an area that I really have focused on for the last couple of decades in my career. Last semester, I was teaching this at the University of Guam. I was teaching a U.S. foreign policy class. And it really helped me to focus a lot of the thoughts that I have about where Guam sits in the geopolitical framework because uh, just to kind of bring up just a few for those didn't know, when I left Guam in 2000, uh, I went to the States, I worked at Housing and Urban Development as a Deputy S Secretary, uh, I was a Beltway Bandit for a while at Pentagon, Transportation, Energy, and then in 2004, I was appointed the Deputy Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. Uh, as a two-star general equivalent, senior executive service position, reported to Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. And that, to me, was one of the most challenging position that one can ever have, but you learn about geopolitics. You learn how pieces you move in Washington. You're part of actually shaping those pieces in Washington. In the course of that, I served in Iraq uh, during those years. It's had about a third of my time there. Uh, was shot at, bombed. Uh, I mean, it, was, it was something. Because we had a law enforcement background, we were allowed to carry a block because I had investigators that worked for me but you need a lot more than a lot. So I had to grow up with a whole team of guys with body armor. I have to have body armor too. Uh, but you know, as I say to people, it doesn't matter. If I was sitting there and I was talking to the Prime Minister of Iraq, and he would say to me, so where are you from? And I always was like, I'm from Guam, which inevitably started this whole conversation of you're from Guam. One time I was with uh, the, the IG in, in Congress, and we were talking to one of the senators who now I'm just having one of these old senior rights. He was the former Secretary of Navy, at Jim Webb. Okay. Jim Webb. And we were trying to talk about Iraq issues, and we were talking about, okay, we got to get Iraq reconstruction program. And then I mentioned that I was from Guam, and then he didn't want to talk about Iraq. He wanted to talk about Guam for the whole time. It was kind of annoying the inspector general. So anyway, so, so that's the framework. And I, I, I don't say that so much to sell myself. Of course, I'm a politician, so now I, I, take, I can't take that back anymore. But I say that to let you know that that's what informs the positions that they give you on where Schwab sits in the geopolitical. Mm -hmm. um, when I got out of the government, I formed a company, Manson International, and that's what we do. We advise defense companies uh, that are working very closely with the federal government right now. And a huge focus is Indo-PECA. What is happening? Where is that going? And, and what does Guam really need to know? Uh, there was a two-hour conference call that happened at 4 a.m. on time, but a lot of that I'm going to share with you and convey to you, and I hope we have a really active question and answer period so that I can, you know, find out what is it you, you are curious about, what do you want to know, just pepper me with questions, and I think that'll be helpful to it. So first, um, there's three big pieces that are framing the things that are happening in Guam and affecting a lot of what's happening. Um, the first one, global supply chains. So in addition to the fact that we have the typical Jones Act issues and we have you know, distance issues, there are two major global supply chain issues that are affecting us right now. So if you're wondering why Payless is having a hard time or you ordered something from Amazon, they said it was coming in a week, it was been two months. Uh, that's because there's two things simultaneously happening in the world. So if you look at the whole world, and I wish that you guys had PowerPoint, because I used to have some really cool graphics to go with this. But if you look at the world, there are very defined key routes, and there's not that many of them, that bring all of the goods in the world from one point to the other. And, and now almost everything has a component or a part that's made in another part of the world. Um, and so right now you have not one, but two choke points. You probably know that most of the goods that come from Europe going this way, and I'm getting a mess here from Matt because he knows some of this stuff, so he could probably tell you. 
But the, the Red Sea is, is one significant choke point. And then the other one is Panama Canal. There's a major drought, and that has you know, reduce the amount of ships that can go this year. I believe it's starting to ease up a little bit now, but, but these things are affecting, you know, it doesn't directly affect one, but we also need to sort of keep that in mind because then we have to look at that. And what that also brings into the indo pacific region is sort of the importance of the Pacific, the Straits of Malacca, the where these goods and services go. They go through these waters. And the fact that the majority of goods in the world that move around at some point move through the Indo-Pacific, forget about the competition with China. That is a key issue that is making Guam incredibly important. Second thing to keep in mind, why are we defending Taiwan, right? It's like, okay, it's a political issue. No, 90% of the specialized chips that make most of our defense weaponry that make refrigerators smart, that make American cars work, are made at one foundry in Taiwan that it's going to be almost impossible to replicate in the United States. I mean, if you have to wear special equipment, you can't have a spare fiber on the gown that you put on when you go in to work on these things because they're so incredibly small. And between all the regulations we have, the cost of hiring people, the training, the billions of dollars it takes, it, you know, it's, it's really something. So exact unions, all of that. So when you're looking at why is the United States in this competition with China, what is, what is the big competition? There's so many things going on behind the scenes, right? If, if something happens, if China gets incorporated, if China decides it's gonna incorporate Taiwan, it's going to cripple our actual defense industry, which, by the way, we are not in the one in defense anymore in the world. I mean, people don't really track this either. China has a bigger navy than us. They've always had a bigger army than us. In one year, they will have a bigger air force than us. They are doing better when it comes to space. And a lot of people have this notion that, oh, but we're ahead on tech. Well, as we've been dis decoupling from China, a lot of those guys that came to U.S. universities are going back, and they are building their own tech. Kind of like Korea, right? When Korea started out, we helped them, we gave them a leg up, and they were sort of back goods. Everybody wanted the Chinese or the, the Japanese goods. The Japanese goods were better. And then before you know it, Korea just kind of came out of nowhere and took it because they actually rose, right? So there's this discussion of you know where where does Guam fit into all of these things? So. That's, that's one big geopolitical piece. The second thing that we need to realize is Guam's value right now to the military is largely geographical. We are the only, everybody knows this, U.S. territory, the only U.S. land where we don't have to give permission. They're going to be here when they need us. And that's, you know, you can have all the agreements with the Philippines for EDCA sites. You can have all the agreements with Japan and South Korea. But what if there's down to competition with Taiwan? Is Japan going to be allowed to launch your planes from their territory, risking their own people? I think no. I mean, when we got into the war with Iraq, Turkey, who had been our friend up until that point, said, no, you can't go over Turkey. And we had to figure out where, where we would fly. Philippines may love us now, but if we get into a competition with China that turns lethal, the Philippines is not going to sacrifice themselves to let us reach their land. The only place that's going to be able to oppose that and ground that and send you that it is Guam. So a lot of that thinking is military. Some of it is economic, right? It's the flow of goods. It is the importance of technology. It is the availability of rare earth minerals that are sort of the future. Um, it is the movement of fuels that make everything go. And all of that is sort of grounded in this concept that Guam in the next five years is going to become the logistics hub of the Indo-Pacific from the United States perspective. So if you look at Admiral Paparo's testimony, Admiral Paparo is going to be the new head of the indo Company Center, a place at Tolino. He just testified before the Senate. He must have said 20 times in his testimony that everybody needs to be focused on the conditions west of the international date lines. And what that means is, it's not Hawaii anymore. Hawaii used to be where the military kind of got everybody together in the Pacific, Guam was like little brother, that's not the case. 
it is one. They are bringing a two-star for the Army. They are not only building a Marine base, there is space command that is going up. There is a tsunami of federal aid that is going to hit us, and it is not a good thing unless we know how to work that. There are so many unintended consequences. Poaching. I mean, one of the things that's going to come up right now, when they open that military base, they're going to need 750 civilians to do things like logistics and contracting and management and care, this, that. Where are those 750 people going to come from, right? Either we're going to have this crush of H2 workers who want housing, or guess what they're going to do? For all of the businesses here, they're going to hire your best people at Haven Ward. Dope. Because that's, what they're, that, that's what's going to happen. So these are things that have to motivate us now. How would you start now or campaigning, building a workforce, an intelligent workforce that is able to grow? How do we keep more of our smart talent on bond? Because if you don't want to lose your employees to what's going to happen, and that's just a small piece of what's going to happen. When they bring in the new three subgrades that are going to go, we have new Virginia class subgrades, a $2 billion operation down in Polaris Point. There's a whole contracting office and group and support setting up there. So there are all these pieces that we have to sort of look ahead because DOD puts DOD's interest first. Of course, it's national security. That's what they are supposed to do. <coughs> Mike Bavaco one time in an article was had a quote, which I really loved because I thought it said a lot. He said, you know, Guam sometimes that's a colonial thing where we think things happen to us. We don't think that we have the ability to change it ourselves. And I think, just for all my years of walls and all the things I've thought about, I think we do some types of effort where we think military can take care of us, you know, we'll, we'll be able to know what we need to do. And it takes everybody here to understand that, you know, they don't mean to do something that will harm us, but in the end, there are a lot of things that are destabilizing. The housing, this idea of poaching, you know, I, I wrote an article about the police, right? That, that's what's happening is, there's only so many people to go around, and if we don't get serious about that happening, it's going to follow out the world outside of the fence, right? And and all that money that's flowing, oh, Bob's going to get $3 billion, yeah, behind the fence. So we have to think about that. What do we need to do? How do we balance that so that Guam rises as the military is going to increase its presence and what it wants to do? Um, now, on the logistics side, something important to think about, we are more a target than we know. So I'll, I'll give you a quick story. So I don't know how many of you know, but Ukraine for 17 years was trying to disengage from the Russian power grid. It wanted to disengage from Russia and it wanted to connect to the EU, to Europe. It was working on this for 17 years. The first test, they, they had started to set up the lines, the first test of getting off that grid and actually connecting to the European grid happened Sweet. in February two years ago. Four hours after that test, Russia invaded. Not a lot of people talk about that, that's not out there in the media, but what that says is, is this about political clashes? Or is this really about money, resources, where does it go? Okay, so in the case of Guam, we have to understand that business line that's running underneath there. So what are we? We are that logistics hub. They are going to have to harvest Guam because you know, missiles are not aimed at us because they, you know, for any other reason, it's not only because the planes are out of action, they can move the planes. It's not only because the submarines are down in, at the port, they can move those. But the way that wars are fought, when you're out there in the Pacific and you're the Chinese, you don't go up to the aircraft carrier trying to shoot the aircraft carrier. That thing's armed in the teeth. What do you shoot? You shoot all the fuel tankers. Because if there's no fuel tankers that can go up and refuel that aircraft carrier, it's just sit there. And where's that fuel tanker coming from? I mean, coming from Guam. Right? But you think about our power system. Like, I keep on telling, uh, it's great, we've got this movement to try and part the Guam's power. It's not about the typhoons only, because yes, climate's going to get more crazy. I expect that will increase, that we'll have to protect it from typhoons. But putting it underground would also protect us from, God forbid, the four kilometer radius of a blast that might come through the 360 degree missile system. 
Unfortunately, it's the way I think. I know it sounds crazy, but I was in places where you know how far the blast goes of what you need to do to protect what you think about. Think that. I heard this yesterday, and it's actually yeah. kind of concerning because the way it was said, and this was some folks from, from DOD that were on this call, they said the power system is created to work for the population of one. But the military is completely integrated into the power system. So they use that power system. 20% of GPA power goes to the basics. That fact makes one's power system a legitimate military target. Yeah. So let that say again. When they war game all of this, GPA is a legitimate military target. So if GPA is a legitimate military target, then we need to harden that target so that it's not vulnerable. Not only so that we have some power where we can survive technologies, but as a matter of national security. So there are all these other levels of, of things that are going on that you know we need to sort of look at as an island. There's going to be a big question on fuel distribution, right? I don't know how many of you heard of Red Hill, 400 million gallons of fuel story in Hawaii, in 50-year-old tanks underground, they leaked, people got really sick, ruined the water table. In today's world, EPA and everybody would not let that happen. You would obviously have the controls to create something that's a much safer. But the question is, whether we want to or not, that fuel supply, which has to be somewhere. I mean, we all love renewable energy, but at the last I checked, I don't think solar panels work on F-16. So you've got to have that 58% of the world still runs on fuel. So where does that fuel go? Is Guam prepared to be that fuel hub that then disperses to, if she can't put it too far away, <coughs> what are you going to get it? So is that Guam going to become that? We don't have enough capability at the moment. Who's going to build that? How are we going to figure out those pieces out? That's a, that's a big issue. Um, on the issue of nuclear power, uh, something that I heard yesterday, which I thought was really interesting and I wanted to share with you. So. A couple of, I pick up pieces and I try to put them together to try and figure out where, where is the military going. So the military on Guam is right now actually talking about creating microgrids with the bases, both with the Air Force base, the Navy base, and some other places, so, so that they can have the ability to connect different types of power to it, you know, solar, uh, you know, the generators, and to flow it in different directions. So it's not just created a cabris and send them north or create it with the do and they kind of go. So they want to create microgrids so you can move it around. And then you all probably heard about that group of scientists that came out that was looking at nuclear reactors. It's a bit cheap. The interesting thing about nuclear reactors is the technology is a lot more advanced than people actually talk about. They have created portable, relatively affordable nuclear power components that take the uranium, put them in a shell that is basic, it makes it safe. You can actually almost hold it in your hand and it will last for hundreds of years, be safe, there's a safe way to handle it. They've been working on this for decades, right? I mean, the cost of solar panels came down 80% in the last three years. Technology is doing incredible things. So when we're looking at the future where you can create a 200 megawatt power plant that is using a small amount of nuclear material that can be, and you know, nobody in the States is letting this happen until it passes all the way. They have to be absolutely sure everyone's thought, no three mile islands here, right? It has to be safe and effective. But while we're looking at that, you know, while, while Wong has its own opinion, do we want that to be here, do we not want that to be here, DOD is kind of moving ahead of all plans to see can this be done. And we need to keep in mind that in seven years, seven to ten years is the estimate, there is going to be a significant amount of these small, relatively affordable to build. So right now they're saying one of those 200 megawatt plants, if you build them to scale, they they kind of get the numbers, they can get it down to about $500 billion. And the interesting thing about that is that's a one-time cost, and then you don't have to have fuel. You're not talking about fuel surcharge or there's a war in the middle to your power, but it's, it's done. You, the fuel is in there, it lasts for a lifetime. You put it in, it doesn't create greenhouse gases. I mean, there's a lot of things to be said for it. And I hear sometimes people saying, well, you know, we don't want to use their power up once if anything ever happens, which doesn't factor in 
which is the, the, the reality of how many nuclear class submarines do we have parked right now at the port? Yeah. And, and well, none of us, I think, have a security clearance to ask the question what's in the mountains, right? So, so we have to think, we have to be open, I think, to all of these concepts that are coming at us. I think, um, I, I talk a lot about AI and other uh, capabilities, but I think that the changes that we are seeing with AI, the changes that we are seeing with autonomous sea, air, and drone technology, and how that is going to to reshape what happens, are also areas that are going to move so fast that I think all of us in this room, if we got together, you know, a year from now, would we'll be shocked that it went that far in one year because the, the exponential change that we are seeing in this region is, is really something incredible. So these are all sort of things that I'm I'm trying to to make sure that Guam gets out of our shell, that Guam understands more what these pieces are for two reasons. One, so we can prepare ourselves. Um, when the military is talking about the 360 degree missile defense, that's great. But we not Guam need to have a completely reworked civil defense plan to keep us Guam. Do we have enough water and battery backup if something does happen? What if they take out the port and we have no way to bring fuel up? Power plants will run out in a matter of days, no one will be able to use a car. When you, it, it's, a, it's a worst case scenario and people don't like to think about that because they're like, well that could never happen. Okay, well nobody in Israel thought that that was going to happen either. No, you know, it was, there are these unexpected events, the whole thing about war, nobody tells you it's going to happen. And, it's a typhoon, you're conditioned for get ready because it's coming. That's the whole thing about the horse and shock. Nobody expects it to happen and then it happens. So really it is up to us not to depend on the federal government to do our speaking for us. They will help us, they know it's their responsibility, but their first responsibility is to themselves and to national security. And we support that 100%. But we have to take the responsibility to understand that as a community, we need to think through these things. They're not pleasant things to think about, but from my years in Iraq, I'll tell you, the first things, I mean, as soon as I heard that, I was thinking, look at Afghanistan. We have 170,000 people. This place really got hit by something and we needed to do something. And the, and the two areas, or the three areas where we have major uh, runways got compromised and the port got compromised. We could not move 170,000 people off the plot to a safe place. It would be impossible. What would happen? Where, how would we get? That, you know, if you, if you took out the port, which is a, a significant military location, where would the food come in? So, so part of the reason I think like that is with my UOG class, we were using war meeting, and I wanted them to really have that broad of view. To put Guam in context, when people say we're the tip of the spear, it's not a casual thing. There, the United States government would never spend on six billion dollars on a 360 degree missile defense system for a place unless a whole bunch of people at Pentagon hadn't thought really long and hard and run this to run the numbers and, and had people in every location and consulted with people that you know you, you can't even say the names of their organizations and come to the conclusion that we need to invest to protect this place. As an I mean, one thing that did make me happy is as a part did say this testimony too. He said, my number one priority is the 170,000 Americans living in war. Which to me was a huge statement. When he was standing before Congress, realizing that, you know, the people who vote are all 50 states, right? But he understood that, and he understands the criticality of one yeah. from a military perspective. But I think what I wanted to emphasize with this is it's not only military. There is a commercial aspect to everything as well. It's the goods and services, it's the telecom, it is the, it is the essence of securing the ship making and all the raw materials that need to go into that in order to keep the world functioning and succeeding and growing, keep the AI development moving, is you've got to also make sure that access to all of these markets, all of these countries, all of these resources continues to happen. So that's a couple of thoughts. I think two last party thoughts that businesses here need to sort of keep in mind. The cyber world and essence uh, computer safety is going to also exponentially get more dangerous for us. 
we have escaped the bullet. Um, there was a joke over at GPA. They're like, yeah, we're like completely online yet. And so maybe that's why they can really hack us and take us offline. But that's not the case. I mean, a lot of companies are all depending on the cloud because you know, all of these technology nations. And if those get taken away from us, if the satellite gets taken out, if Russia decides to use their satellite to take out, you know, the key communication satellite, that could affect us here on Guam. If China decides, China for years and years and years has been building all of the infrastructure for ports all over the world. Today, they control significant amounts of infrastructure in 96 ports around the world. Not the United States, that's China. So that the top three makers, all the equipment that go into ports, even in the United States, is Chinese. So why would they be doing that? Why are they setting that up? What, what shifts are going to happen? And then how is that going to affect us? Are we prepared for the cyber issues that are going to happen to be, have they really actively pushed you know, our schools to create different curriculum? Because I'll tell you, the curriculum that we all have is how good work in this future world. You've got to have a curriculum that prepares people for the technical pieces of the world that are coming. And we can't just depend on higher digital from Long Island to help us figure it out. We've got to figure that out as well. So these are all sort of broad thoughts I wanted to throw out there. Um, and I've been talking a lot. We've got uh, 15 or so minutes left. So I thought maybe we could open the floor and see if there's issues. Can you pull out the Pavis? I uh, recently went to a lecture in San Francisco from the, the Chinese experts from the Pacific Times and the Pacific Times who announced it. Very interesting talk. And out of that talk, he specifically asked about Chinese going past Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he said that most people are thinking 28, 29. And it was his opinion and of his information that he gave to us that night that it was more like 2025. Yes, real. yes. So, but you brought that up. So there is a disconnect. There is a disconnect in Washington. If you look at how Washington is the budgeting, right? So look at what they did in Ukraine. Five years before Ukraine happened, they knew something was gonna happen. They put $11 billion in place. They kind of prepped Poland. They knew this was gonna happen, right? So when it happened, we were prepared. We put serious money into Europe. If you look at what they're doing with the Indo-Pacific, Washington has not yet fully embraced the idea that this is a real thing. So Washington has the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. They put about one fifth of that in there. They kind of, you know how they are in, in the OV when they move money around and just put it in another bucket and then they call it new money. It's not really new money. So there's not a lot of new money yet. Which signals that Washington's still a jerk. Washington thinks, oh, China, they're not gonna do to something that forward. Maybe, you know, it's a gamble, right? We don't think they're going to. So that's that. If you talk to anyone who is currently working in the indo pacific region, either the State Department or the Department of Defense, things today, 2025 to 2027, they are prepared for war. And they're frustrated because they see the political apparatus that's in Washington, D.C., still looking at the, the diplomatic sides of it saying, no, we're, you know, we're, we're challenging you, it's not gonna happen. And they don't have that luxury, plus they have a lot of different inputs they look at, because they are on the ground. The US military and, and the Department of Defense are all over the Western Pacific, preparing as we speak. There are groups coming in, I think a couple of them, and like, we're going out, trying to prepare, trying to get pieces, logistics pieces in place, access in place, understand how do you operate on those small islands, because if you think about it, the United States has been operating in Iraq and Afghanistan. Totally different uh, environments. One is mountainous and one is a bunch of desert, right? And, and how do you tackle an island when you can't even bring the ship up within, you know, distance because there's reefs and shallows and, I mean, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly complicated. So DOD hears that and I hear to speak about this 27 is a potential. The other thing he talked about is that the issue of their economics was that if you were looking at their economy, I think the perception is that the Chinese economy just keeps growing, growing, growing. And he said, no, it's not. In fact, it is actually starting to adapt. That if you look at the trajectory of that economy, that they will be such social predators within China that the leaders of China are going to be forced into starting something 
right? I'm distracted by different ones. They're actually going to be going through their social upheaval that's going to happen in the country again in one to three years. Yes. Because Chinese people have now decided that they like having nice things. And as they start to get those things, they take it away from them. Yeah. And there are some underground stuff. We get epic times in the because no, they were apparently started by a bunch of Chinese dissidents. Right. Very interesting, too. Uh, they are actually talking about the fact that they, with their contacts, that they believe that there is a peace in the social revolution to happen properly within the next five years. But in China, when that happens, the Chinese government is going to have to do something pretty big. Exactly. So 27, the reason we mentioned this 27, is there's a major communist Chinese party anniversary. And so, you know, Xi Jinping has always said, on the anniversary, we are going to show that uh, we have risen, and, and here's the, the statement of, you know, how we are going to play on the world stage, how we are going to be on Europe on the world stage. But, yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, internally destabilizing forces are at play. Their economy is hurting at the moment. But we also have to remember, purchasing power parity, right? It's not dollar for dollar. We're always looking at, oh, here's how much we're spending, and here's what the Chinese are spending. A Chinese dollar goes way, I mean, a dollar there goes way, way farther than it does in the US. So they're building ships like crazy. They're building military equipment like crazy. They're investing in technology like crazy. And it's cheaper for them to do that. And then if they need to create something to distract people, they'll have both the means to do it and a reason to do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's a stuff that uh, I have a state of mind from this that I read. Um, but the major issue is the TSMC. Yes. Um, and I heard that they're building a factory out of the U.S. Mm -hmm. The main reason why to do that is the man is if it prevents any type of um, instability in the future with all the turbulence that been in Taiwan. Yes. Uh, and same time, as you speak about it that way, you know, what, why would China want to invade Taiwan? Invasion elevates us a lot, like, but it also does a lot of instruction. Right? So, and with, with everything destroyed, there's no all, there's all assets to be tied about the wardens. So, I guess my, my logic is, would China really want to destroy Taiwan to that degree? Yeah. I might be China that's too kind of a pilot. So, that's the, that's the interesting thing about foreign policy, right? You know, it's, it's not engineering. It's not black and white. You can't say yes or no. You can't get a finite number of data points and okay, this is what's going to happen. You're guessing, right? And one of the hardest things about China, they don't call it the Soviet Kingdom, it's nothing. You don't really know because they're not very open about how they think, what they think. And we've got to be careful not to project how we would think about it because we come from a very different place, right? All of our, all of our cultural norms of what we think is a risk to gain are very different from what someone in China would consider a risk in a game. It's a completely different mindset, a completely different culture. And I will tell you, there are like corridors of people at the Pentagon who are tasked with doing just that, that would tell you right off the bat, we don't really know what they're thinking or when they're going to do this. So all you can do is guess. And, and when you're in that position, then the question becomes deterrence. The question becomes, do you want to gamble on it, wait and see if you're going to do something, or do you want to be prepared so that in the unlikely event, because the whole idea is in the unlikely event something happens, you're prepared, because that in itself, the more that we bristle the party line, the stronger we make want, the more Congress puts money behind what is going to happen, the more they think twice about getting into something. If we look like we can't handle the littoral challenge around Taiwan, it will get bold at that to say, you know what, we've got a bit of navy, we've got this down, we, this is our backyard, and America is too weak, and let's move now before they get in a position to do that. And, you know, that calculus is, it's, a, it's, it's like the worst kind of gambling. It's like you're going into a casino and you're going, you put it on black or red, like where do you get your money, right? And and you can't gamble with people's eyes, but here's the important thing to think about, you know, and I heard this from Dr. Henry Cruz, and he was absolutely right. He said, you know, it's one thing, and, and it sounds awfully, it, it, we don't mean just any community gets hit. You know, a community gets hit in, in, 
in mainland US, right? The US is still there. It would be horrible there have lost life if the US as an entity is still there. If something ever were to happen at once, not only would it wipe out every precious life here, Guamas boxes, the culture, the people, the history, Guam would, would, I mean, there is that potential. We have to think about that, right? Guam, I mean, as much as the Pacific Islands talk about global warming, if it goes to the point that the ocean rises and the island doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. When we're looking at our future and the kids of our kids and what are they going to have in Guam, we want to take every precaution that we can and place the very opportunity that we can to not only enhance the life that we have, but to protect the lives that we have and to protect us all to make sure that we are still around because these are, are serious thoughts that, you know, and I'm sure there's people who are saying, oh, you know, oh you're, you're just exaggerating. It's, people have to think about these things. It's unpleasant. Um, and, and it's not that we should be scared, but we, we need to really think here because there are things here that I'm sure everybody here is thinking about. In our own area, what do we need to, to support, prepare for, understand, um, in order to operate in the world that's very different? There is a threat now that exists, and we need to everything to make sure that that threat level goes down, to push that threat level down so that there's less exposure and so that we can have more agency, so we can be more responsible in Guam for our futures and not expect that someone else will be riding in on a white horse and take care of it. So that's that's the, the thing that that's being asked for truth. And they could. I'm going to speak up again. Uh, there was a shh. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there was a uh, favorite room. I've been on my own. I just got back. Love me, Jen. The sun is that uh, there were uh, Chinese naval ships uh, yeah, from right. Guam last week. That's true. Happened several times, yeah. So they've been buzzing us uh, as close as found to be even closer than that. Um, and, and they have been routinely testing uh, and then sending ships out. And if you think about it purely from the U.S. perspective, uh, you know, it, it's concerning because they're testing, they're seeing how far can they put their forces, what can they see. It was kind of like when they sent the balloon over, you know, California or wherever, the, the northern United States. If you, you have to see that they're testing. But at the same time, you know, going to your point, this is their backyard, the Pacific. They, they haven't attacked anybody that we know of in, in the recent past in this part of the world. They have their challenges with India, a couple other places, some territorial challenges. But here, it's all been mostly peaceful. It is the Pacific, after all, right? So they are saying that they, and you have to think about their perspective. They're saying they have just as much right to patrol and protect the freedom of navigation on the seas as the United States does. And their point is it's their backyard, not the U.S.'s backyard. So there's a reason, but trust me, everybody in the Pentagon is, is tracking those ships very carefully. What are they dropping? Are they, they could easily put a drag down, cut all the cables that we have, and all of a sudden blackout. And again, it's a big game, right? But one gets affected. They cut all those cables, what happens to us? What stops? Banking stops. You know, the, the connections for healthcare stops. Uh, you know, all sorts of things. You, you just think it through, right? Second order, third order, what eventually happens. So there are all these scientific vessels the China found us, and those scientific vessels are moving around, they're checking what's going, and you know, are they truly doing that, or are they mapping the seafloor to understand where everything is? And you know, nowadays, we're talking about sea drums, we're doing, you know, they're talking about putting canisters on an ocean bed, and being able to you know, push a button to deploy underground drums that would then come up and be able to do all sorts of, of different things. So, uh, you know, the, the ownership of the seabed is another area where Guam has to think really carefully because there's several things happening in the ocean. You don't, you don't see what's underneath there, but there are massive amounts of rare earth dolls that are needed for the next generation for consuming, for affordable um, uh, energy, uh, you know, energy efficient uh, devices. Um, there's you know, climate research, there's the cables that are going down there. Um, that is uh, mining geo drilling and mining underwater. Uh, all of these things are happening. So there's a commercial aspect. It's trying to, trying to get the advantage commercially. 
So the Defense Force Calendar is it trying to get the advantage militarily to prepare for, for what's going to happen? Um, or is it just trying to, to show a force and let us know that they're there? Thank you, Chippa. Thank you, Mr. Thank you.